Welcome back to the More in Common podcast. Uh, this is part two of the Devin Larkin conversation. Uh, I hope you had a chance to take a listen to part one. And if you liked it, definitely give us a share, a comment. Hey, send us some comments about things you like or don't like about the show. And we are always looking to improve. Well, with that said, have a great experience checking out the rest of this awesome conversation with Devin Larkins. I would say to some extent, you know, maybe three years old, I think. Um, you know, when she could start, I felt like when she could comprehend, you know, and kind of have like really decent sentences, you know, or I think so yeah, somewhere around like three when I started to treat her like that, because I thought it would, it, you know, it just made sense. And, you know, to your last point, you know, where, where parents say, um, or just do it, you know, kind of thing. Parents are lazy. They are lazy and they don't want to have, cause that's the easy way out. Oh, I just don't want to talk about it or just do it. Um, and one of your previous guests, um, I can't remember her name, Mina, maybe, or uh, she uh, was telling the story about uh, being at the beach with the little girl with playing volleyball. Uh, and then she had to talk to her. Uh, Megan. God, Megan. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. Megan. Yeah. yeah. Um, Megan Cher. So, she, you know, and she was, you know, bringing that up. That was like, you Gosh, I'm sorry. I lost my thought. She was like, because it was it was the <laughs> yeah. body image. It was like everybody It was the young, the young woman who's like an acro gymnast. And people were saying, oh, you're so petite, you're so tiny. And yeah. Megan had a feeling like, oh, don't say that to her. And then cause she cause she had body image issues that she was working with. And instead right. of projecting those onto the girl, she asked her how she felt about people saying right. that about her. Yeah. And I remember exactly, yeah, what I, exactly what I was bringing up because she was talking about at the beginning about like talking about sex you know with parents and talking about kids and they're not doing it and it, it made me think about it I was like yeah you know because parents are lazy because they're not trying to have these conversations but it's really a um and you can't even call it an immature it's a, it's a level of immaturity but like we know if you don't attack cancer if you don't cut it out the body it's going to constantly grow like kids are not going to just stop doing these things so like the idea of just saying just do it just further like you said perpetuates the cycle of whatever's going on and things are going to grow and get bigger and fester and then now you have this huge problem where you know your kids that get to be 35 years old and you know they don't talk to their parents and which is a shame because at that point your parents should be chill like it should be like your friend almost but they didn't parents all the time don't build this relationship with their kids you know in the early on so um again i apologize for that long with no, the answer there. no that's that's <laughs> you've given a lot to think about yeah. um i will answer your question keith but on that last on that the middle point parents being lazy i want to say yes i am lazy at times i also think like 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 i think about everything i think there's a scale and i think there's I don't know. Like sometimes parents are tired, which I think lends to the lazy. And I think sometimes they don't know. Yeah, like right. it's hard to do better when you don't know it. And I think some to Keith's point about the generational things, I think it's just it's not even that it's easy to revert to what model we've been given. That is it's not easy. It's just how we're built. It takes it takes not only somebody pointing it out and your awareness of it and your constant focus, like everything that you were talking about in the beginning of this conversation. Um, Cause I, I don't know that everybody knows that like, they're just perpetuating the cycle. Unfortunately, I don't know that everybody knows that. Um, to Keith, to your question, what I would like to say and what I'm, I was thinking through the feedback from my parents cause they watch me parent is that it's kind of that's always been like from day one um and it's little things like when ruby was a year old coming over emptying the dishwasher and it's like my mom was like oh she was like i would a lot like no you would have not been playing in the dishwasher i'm like they're just silverware like i she let her yeah. how's she gonna learn and um I, it, and i don't always get this right but i it's it is a i think it's I started at day one, but it is probably going to be a process all the way through. 
of like reminding myself because there are moments where I'm just like, you need to do this. And like, and I, and then I can feel her energy shift and she starts to get real stubborn. And I realize it's because I just got real stubborn. And then when it works is when, well, when it doesn't work is when I continue like, no, 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 you're going to do this. And when it, when it works is when I'm like, okay, let's talk about it. Let's figure like, let's compromise. Let's figure out a way that we can make this work. Like daddy needs to get this work done. Maybe you want to sit next to me and work or watch Daniel Tiger or whatever it is. And she comes and she's like, I have a good idea. And I'm like, what's your good idea? And she's like, ice cream and TV. And I'm like, Hmm, I don't know if that's it, but thank you for sharing. Like, but I, but it, it becomes a collaborative thing. And it's, it's a constant reminder to get back to that for me. What about you, Keith? Yeah. I mean, I think there, there are a few things. I, I actually want to challenge the sentiment in general of parents being lazy. I think parenting's hard and sometimes taking the easy way out is just the only thing you can do in that moment. Sometimes. And I think, Hey, Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Go watch that like, TV because Daddy's about to pass out. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, my youngest today decided to just empty. This happened today. Just empty all of my change drawer. Not all of it, but a lot of it on my floor. And she's two. And I said, "Well, now you need to clean that up, and you can't play, and you can't play with your toys until you clean this up." She just laughs at me, right? So now I'm doubling down. I'm in an irritated mood this morning. And it's, it's like I'm, I'm reflecting back on that, knowing like I just, I was working. I didn't have, so I just went to the default of you need to do it, right? Like there's no rational conversation. There's, there's no any of those things. And yes, she is too. Um, I think that as far as what we have done, has always tried to reflect the the stature of our children, like w- how we assess their maturity, what they're at, and just treating them like people um, all the time. You know, talking to them like people, not doing baby talk. Um, you know, certainly just as as things progress, working through things, giving them options, giving them choices, getting their opinions. And boy, do they have them. Um, and so <laughs> oh, you, it's you, funny, you were saying you were saying uh, assessing their stature. I'm like, man, that's it's that's one of those tough things because it changes like moment to moment. Sometimes. And, and it's sometimes it's like you were the most uh, like my oldest. And she's four and she's very mature. And then so it's hard on that end of the spectrum to respect her maturity when she turns into a four year old. Right. Like. She lives like a 16 year old and then all of a sudden she's a four year old again. And my expectation has anointed her as this mature 16 year old. So now I need to treat her like a four year old, not a 16 year old. And it's really hard going back and forth and and navigating. But at the same time, doing that is treating them like people, right? Because that's what you have to do with your friends and your family. Like I have to adjust when you're in a bad mood. Like I've got to adjust when my wife is in a bad mood or in a great mood or wants to do something. It doesn't want to do something. She's not the same person all the time. Rodney's not the same person all the time. So, but when it comes to our children, that that ego component of it, it's like, you're too young to know and I need to flex. And it's, it's hard not to, it's hard not to, it's, it's, it's hard not to fall into that trap. And, And I certainly get why parents do. Um, because being aware of that, navigating that, and being very, very clear in the mud about it is is hard. It's, it, it, it's, it's a question. daily grind. Yeah. In your estimation, is it possible to accurately label whether somebody else is being lazy? Hmm. I guess technically, you know, like no, but then 
you know, I guess you only say that they're being lazy because you're judging them off of how you would react to the situation or what your perspective, what they should be doing. Anytime I think you use the word should, it, mm. it's a level of entitlement, you know, that you're using. Um, so technically, no, it's not lazy. You know, technically, no, you can't really call anyone lazy because they got their own world going on that they're trying to deal with because we're not always into it. You know, some people said that I'm lazy at points, you know, and I don't, Mm -hmm. I I know that I'm not, lazy. you know, but at a moment I could be for sure. Um, So technically, no. I, I, yes. And I would only add that it is a yes to the question or yes to what Devin said. To to what Devin said, like everything Devin said, I was going to say. Um, But I would also add, or, and I would also add that by judging someone as lazy, oftentimes we're judging them based on a reflection of what we see from them. And this is the concept, in my opinion, of meeting people where they are. Um, If I meet Devin for the first time and he's sitting around watching TV, and that's the only thing I ever know about him, I could say, oh, he's, he's lazy, but I know nothing about Devin, right? I know nothing about his, the, how he lives the 23 other hours in a day or the 364 other days in a year. Um, and even, even people you work with or live with like Rodney, you know, I could, you could call me lazy sometimes. And it's like, but you haven't observed how I worked the other 23 hours in those small interactions that we had had in one given day were when I was being lazy, maybe in a moment, but to, to call, cause we're all lazy at times, right? Like we all have our lazy moments. I think it's part of being human. Um, but to call someone lazy, I, I agree with all of the things that you said, Devin, what about you, Rod? I agree. How do you answer your things. own question? Um, <laughs> I answer my own question with just wondering still, I mean, I, I, do think I agree with everything you said, Devin. I think just listening to us talk about it here, it just made me wonder. It, it seems like it's very much root, like the laziness is very much rooted in judgment or it's like a sub category of judgment where I can assess if I'm being lazy, but I can only ask you if you're being lazy or like why maybe you're not doing something. Um, so it's kind of making me reassess because Keith, we had had a conversation about it at one point somebody we were working with and it was just like it was very much i think we realized we were just judging and like making a lot of assumptions about what they were and weren't doing and the only way to clear it up was to ask questions so i don't know i just thank you i th- appreciate you indulging me i'm still trying to figure I it think, out yeah i think Devin, you hit the point on the head is you're judging based on how you like how you react or would react Right. And, and, and it's how you would react about a particular thing, right? Like, say you're into sports and if you played baseball or football or basketball, you would play it 24 hours a day, but the person that's playing it is only doing it 10 hours a day. They're lazy. Right. But then on the flip side, maybe it's computer engineering and you don't like computer engineering, but you're the computer engineer and someone who loves computer engineering, but isn't. They'd be like, you're, you're lazy because you're not doing it as much as I would do it if I had it. Right. And, and I think that's the the crux of it. Right. This also bumps up against the limits of English. And I think depending on the, the way somebody's using it, because as you were saying that I was thinking of programming, like good programmers are lazy. Like you take the easiest route to get to the answer. The most simplistic route is like going to meet that most elegant code or water is lazy. It takes the easiest route to find egress. Um, uh, humans, I think parents often take the easiest route. I think, so I think it depends on the context and or the meaning that you're using when you're coming to the word. Damn, yeah. language, English is just, it's just it's And then complex. another thing too, that like people just might work another way. It makes me think about uh, Rick Rubin. Um, you, are you familiar with Rick Rubin? Um, he talks about like when he's in the studio, he just lays down, you know, and working as he's laying down and people look at it and say, oh, he's, 
he's lazy. He's not doing X, Y, Z properly. Like, but it's just how he works. And I mean, it's Rick Rubin, you know? So it, again, it's just other people projecting their thoughts of how things should be on him, you know? And it's not, it's technically not good, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And this is probably what causes so much issue in organizations or culturally, like when we're looking at different groups and, oh, they're lazy, right? Blacks are lazy. Mexicans are lazy. Like whatever the the stereotype is. And it's like, no, they they work. They The one I've seen work differently than me. So they must be lazy. Or um, I think that's that's a that's a good observation. That's an astute observation. Yeah, especially, you know, like to piggyback off of that point right there. If you think about like when, you know, the idea of black people were lazy, you know, happened when people did become free slaves you know, they were, they said, you know, black people would just sit there and just relax all day. And it's like, you know, someone's called them lazy, but like, hell yeah. Like if I just gave you 50 years of life of, you know, of really grinding and working, yeah, not need to relax. So it's not even them being maybe lazy in the moment, but it's a justifiable laziness because I just finished grinding, you know. For, that is, you know. that is the gaslight of all gaslights. Like <laughs> you were my slave picking cotton for me in my hot ass fields, and I'm gonna call you lazy for sitting yeah. around for a day. When hmm. when you have an opportunity to be to, to do while that. I was sipping lemonade <laughs> on the front <laughs> because stoop of my because porch. now you you finally have a choice in your life, and you chose to sit <laughs> because you've been standing for 25 years or however long you were. Hot damn, were I knew it. Slave. Them blackies are lazy. Yeah. If, if we it. don't tell them what to do, they're not going to do anything. I think that's really what the conclusion is to draw here. Yay, eugenics. Let's, let's start since, about since it, we right? got on this train of thought, uh, <laughs> earlier we, we asked you about uh, social justice, and you said getting better. Um, you said it's, it's progressing. What, I, I, I want to go there. I wanna, what, like, what's your take on where we are in the world right now and, and justice? Oh, well, I think when I, we're, I must say we're getting better with the fact that it's even being a conversation for one. Um, and it's getting better where I feel very comfortable that if I walk down the street or if I, you know, talk to someone that's, you know, from a different race, I'm not going to get lynched, you know, or anything like that. And that's what I mean. Like, it's getting better. Like, so we're moving in the right direction. Is it complete? Not, no chance. Not at all, obviously. Like, but I think it's, it's going in the right direction. Some things that are going on that I don't think that it's okay, particularly, but I think that it's it's working towards something because the way that I grew up, granted, I'm still having a similar conversation I'm having with my daughter that my parents had with me and who, you know, and so on and so on, but we're moving a, further away from violence, which is good. Um, but it's it's just, we got a lot of ways to go. <laughs> yeah, which I'm sure most people can agree with. There's um, a, some, some, an observation that I've been sensing lately, and I don't know why or where, and maybe it's within me, but, you know, as the race conversation has come up in my lifetime, there's always resistance to it, right? You know, as the old trope goes, don't play the race card. And that resistance at the cultural majority, um, white people in particular, um, has always won out, right? So then the conversation of race gets put back into the corner, into the subculture, or into the barbershop or wherever it ends up being, but it's out of the mainstream and it's no longer a thing. There is that, res like I feel that resistance losing out right now, like that resistance, oh, we don't need to talk about that or we don't need to overindulge on it or we don't need to you know play the race card in this particular situation i hear it in corners but culturally in mass the conversation is still being driven and then you know you, at least that, that's an observation i've seen as far it's as partially goes is partially a nod to capitalism i think i think for the first time that i'm aware of with with or with companies realizing that it's less profitable to be silent on social issues than it is to say something. 
it's something things are mo- like things are are happening for tons of reasons but like that's a first and i think that's causing some progression and i think it's also causing some pushback when you said the violence piece devin i like it's weird like this is where i think media gets real tricky um and i don't hate the media by any means i think it gets tricky because like right now these rash of these, these recent like the hate crimes against asian americans um is is very front and center for me so i'm like is the violence going down but like i know that the actual the actual crime stats are better than they were 25 50 years ago um what i do think i what i what i have sensed especially coming out of the last out of the trump administration is a more targeted violence, a more vocal and targeted violence towards people of color, towards LGBTQ plus, towards Asian, towards anyone who is not in that white people, white people majority. There has been some targeted violence, but it is not what it used to be. And it is not, it's not like a majority of the violence, but it's, it's there. And I think that's the thing that messes with me because uh, while i walk down the street right here i don't fear getting lynched but i do think about i still very consciously think about every interaction that i have with white people in my neighborhood or like just i don't know like just how i how i am out in public here in la um i still very much think about it every day so whether or not that's needed is another thing, right? Keith, you were like, is this my percent? Is this real or is this just in me? Um, but, you know, go ahead. And I, I think, you know, I can, you know, totally agree with it. It's something that, you know, I think about and I'm aware of, um, you know, especially interactions with police officers. Like, I still get a little tense, you know, when they're just driving behind me or whatever. And I know that I didn't do anything. Like, um, you know, my license is updated, my registration, but it's like, you know, it could go really bad, you know, at any point. Um, but it's, but that's what I'm saying. Like, it's, it's, you know, it's better. You know, I don't think I'll just get, you know, totally targeted and pulled out the car, which I know it still happens and it definitely could happen, but it's, um, it's a little bit easier to do if I just think now it's like the, you know, the kind of racism that we're dealing with is just, you can't even really see it anymore. You, it's hard to even feel it. And then, it's hard to even call it out sometimes too, because some of it is mistakenly done, but like I, I vehemently believe it's still wrong because, you know, it's not always murder. Sometimes it's manslaughter and it's still a crime, you know, mm-hmm. the way we don't, somebody's still dead. Even, somebody's still dead. Exactly. You know, so it's like, it's still going on and it's still happening, but you know, as long as we, you know, constantly keep talking about it and pushing to the forefront, eventually it'll get better. Like it just has to, because, I mean, maybe I'm just too optimistic, but the world is always getting better. No, I mean, it's 100% better than it used to be. You said something right there. It's like, whether it's on purpose or not, I think that's that's the the hardest part of, of living in a country that is built on a racist infrastructure, that it affects every single one of us. Me, my mom, my brother, my sister, you, Keith. Like it affects us all what like whether or not we acknowledge it, whether or not we try to be a part of it, whether or not we're trying to be apart from it, is so woven into the structures of this country that it just is. So sometimes this person here that denied you this bank loan or did this didn't do it because they hate you or they hate black people. But the reason that that rules, the rules exist that they're following are because of that. And and it's hard to parse that to your point. And I mean, those those prejudices, those biases, those, you know, outright bigoted uh, sentiments pervade um, and affect the psyche. And as they get better, they become less overt, not just towards you, but inside other people. Right. And then it becomes, a, you know, a reflection of 
having to be aware of the fact that you didn't hire that independent contractor because they were black, not because you sit here and say, boy, I hate black people. Right. <laughs> right but because right. you came across their resume, you saw their picture and you just thought something inside of you that they're probably not the right fit. And, and it may have been a subconscious thought that you didn't even flash. And you didn't even mind. process and you just flipped past the page. And it's that, interwoven nature of those biases that affect how how far we still have to go what that does to me is it puts me on defense most of the time like i am looking for something that i have like i'm i'm heightened uh i'm talking to my parents over the past couple of weeks about their experiences working both of them have experienced times where they were told into their faces by coworkers that the only reason they have a job is because they're black and I've never been told that. I'm sure people have thought it. Um, I can't, like, I, it almost made me cry hearing that from them. Um, and then I was, and I was just like, man, you had to like always be on. Like, there's no, like, we talked about laziness and resting. Like, you don't get to shut down as a black person in at work or at, in the world because you have to be looking out for somebody. That's just like, yeah, nah, you don't even deserve to be here. Oh, see, you didn't do that thing. I knew you, you're lazy. You didn't deserve, you didn't deserve to be here. Uh, let me go ahead and tell your boss. And that is, and like, for me, I've experienced that as like an emotional burnout. And my dad was like resistant to it. And he was like, oh, actually, like I never, he, he just kind of felt like, no, that dr it drives me. And I think it does to a degree. He's just like, I just had to know more and be better and come in and be on all day. And I was like, yeah, that that's exhausting. Yeah. And, you know, and it, it is exhausting. Like, and it's like, like you said, like it's, we, especially now in like tech where, you know, people say, bring your whole self to work, you know, and everything like that, you know, that notion, like, like, I mean, yes, that sounds really good. And, you know, in theory, but then we're also going to acknowledge that, you know, not one company is just hiring only unbiased people only unracist people like it's just impossible like <clears throat> some ceo said that you know my company is just a representation of you know xyz number representation of america so realistically how can i be my whole self if i know that you know s somebody might look at me a little bit differently or because of my beard or my hair you know or whatever it is you know and it's it's um it's hard to deal with and navigate. Um, and it, it's, it's something I think everyone struggles with too. And I, you know, talk to other people um, and they say, you know, say the same thing, not just black people, just um, it's like Asian women, you know, have told me the same thing. Like, Oh yeah, I'm actually this whole other person, you know, that you don't even know. And I was like, Oh wow. And when she started telling me about it, I'm like, Oh wow. Like I had no idea that you talk like this or thought like this. And it was, it was pretty cool. But other people are experiencing the same things. I don't def definitely think it's a black thing at all. Um, it's this, a, you no. know, minority thing, or maybe, or people thing, I think. It's a people I mean, thing, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a human element to it. And then you add in those judgments, right? Going back to judgment. Like, if if you perceive me, especially if you're in power, as lazy, if you are perceived as that based on some cognitive bias that you just don't care to reconcile like all it takes is that one thing that validates that perception and then it's solidified versus as as you know we've talked on the show the 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 benefit of the doubt is a real thing like there is never going to be a time where a, a black person shoots up um Asian spas or spas where predominantly Asian women live and just said, Hey, he's just having a bad day. He was trying to get rid of sex addiction. Like that's, that's that in of itself is the default benefit of the doubt that, that I know I get. Um, and I feel it. Like when you guys talk about these things culturally, I feel the opposite. Like I never feel those things. I feel them at a, at a personal level, right? Like, oh, I'm, is someone going to think I'm, I'm lazy today because I'm actually being lazy, right? Yeah. <laughs> like I'm having, <laughs> having one of those days, not just because of the color of my skin, right? I think like 
particularly with like black people that we feel like we're all responsible for each other to some extent. Like, and if, you know, if I, me as being black, if I don't, if I mess up everybody, you know, now the whole black, mm. you know, race is, you know, they're being looked upon that way. Mm-hmm. And I think the reason why is because when you start thinking about the amount of black African Americans that, and I mean by that, who came from slavery, you know, who didn't come from, you know, Africa, it's, for one, we're only here in America, for one, you know, mostly. And then it's only a very small number of us. So it's like, you know, I think, you know, the statistically there's what 333 million Americans and I think black people represent, you know, 13%, you know? So mm-hmm. then even if you're just working off of that number, that's still, you know, 13 million people roughly. I think I think that's the numbers on it. Like that's not a lot yeah, of about, people at all. That's about New York. 40 million people. About, about 40, about 40 million. million. Okay, got it, yeah. yeah. The 40 out of 333. I got, you know, I got you. Yeah. Yeah. That's you right. Know, like, so that's, it's just a small number of people. So it's like, it's really almost like a tribe. You know, actually, when you think about it, you know, I think that's, you know, plays into the part where it is because you can go certain parts in a, in America. And my cousin, he went to school in Northern Michigan, up in Northern Michigan. And, um, people would stare at them because they just never seen black people before, you know? So it's like, we're not all connected, but in some ways we are connected because there's just so few of us, you know, in the world, you know, in general. And I think that, you know, plays into it, you know, to a lot of it and from our side, you know, from the black perspective, as well as everyone else's perspective, because it's not that many of us. Hmm. I know we're getting close to time and we could go for another two hours. Devin, yeah. like I, I don't know. The there was a moment too. we were talking, like, like just yeah. the dad. Like I just want to just have another dad conversation with y'all. Like I just felt a, this this warm mm-hmm. energy around it. Um, yeah, really appreciate you, Devin. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, no problem at all. I am. Um, I yeah, I could literally talk to y'all forever because you're really um thought provoking <laughs> for one. Um, yeah, and I, I appreciate the time because I learned a lot and, you know, just made me think a lot. So, yeah, I'm, you know, grateful, you know, for this opportunity to chat with you, too. Well, I'm going to, we've got one final question. And that okay. question is, uh, what does compassion mean to you? What does compassion mean to me? Uh, gosh, I don't think I ever really thought about that. Um, I guess just thinking out loud it starts with listening to someone and just being able to accept who that person is and or what that moment is and just under giving people the benefit of the doubt you know actually i think you know might be a good way to another way to describe it and just allowing that moment or that person to be you know who they are and accepting of it you know to be i guess the best way to say Thank you.